Well, hello there, guys and girls. Welcome back to another Friday session live at three. We'll wait a little while. Let everybody start circling around. It's been a fun week around here. The building is up and running, the new DC, that is. So we've had everybody from owners to founders to far off travelers. Everybody's here in town. So it's been a uh, it's been a lot of fun and we're having a little bit more fun this weekend because some of the multimedia staff is going to go out and play with some of the toys from the corral. So if I look a little bit hot and sweaty, that's because I was out front loading up a couple of machines for us to go play with tomorrow. I think we're going to start off on the water and end up on uh, the trail. So it should be interesting. But for right now, I need to spend a little time with y'all, see if I can maybe answer a few questions along the way. And, uh, and, well, not quite call it a week, but at least call it a day and partake of an adult beverage or two other than water. So let's take a peek over at the questions I may have missed last week. Steve had asked me, hey, John, great work on the Z125 frame. Any idea if a GL1800 frame can be mended? Oh, boy. The head stock area is slightly twisted. Steve, I'd be really afraid to uh, try to bend a uh, motorcycle frame, a street motorcycle frame, especially with one with the uh, that's carrying around as much weight as the GL1800. Uh, I would be very hesitant to, to do so, um, not without the appropriate jig to hold it in place and then wrestle it into uh, position. Um, if it's really that twisted, uh, you probably just need to go ahead and suck it up and replace that frame. Uh, that's that would be my, my consideration. I, I probably wouldn't do it because once metal bends once, it's not quite as strong. Even if you bend it back in the same place, it's been flexed. So I, I would I would probably uh, guard against doing that procedure, uh, especially on a gold wing. So sorry. Jason D is, had asked me, hello, John, I have a 2002 TRX 350, so do I, with 75.2 PSI of compression that it puts out a ton of white smoke hmm, from cold to fully warmed up and burns a lot of oil. Cylinder and pistons don't have a scratch anyway, anywhere. Did you pull it apart where you could look at it? Hmm. I'm going to do the valves anyway, but do you think it could be the piston rings? Also, if there was a channel from one head bolt to the other that formed underneath the head gasket. Could that be causing the old burning? Well, definitely. I think you just found it right there. So it sounds like you need to have the surface of the head. If there's, as long as that channel isn't too deep, get it resurfaced because guess what goes up and down on two of those um, bolt hole locations. Well, that's your old passageways. One is for it to go up and the other up to the head and the other is for it to come back down. And if those have found their way into the combustion chamber, well, there's your problem. So yes, I could then believe that your, your piston rings are okay. And it is actually a head gasket failure on the oil side. Not a very common uh, occurrence. So that's, that's unusual, but I would say either a replace if you can resurface the head, great. The cylinder, be careful there because if you resurface it even that much, that means your compression ratio is going to come up and may get a little too close to those valves because, the, the uh, of course, you shorten that distance on the cylinder. Well, guess what? You're shortening the distance to in between your piston and your valves. So be careful there. <coughs> David Punzel had asked me, Sometimes my Rancher 350 will crank over and click when I push the starter. I have to pull the crank cord and move it, and then it will start. Hmm. What does this mean? A bad starter motor or is something in the lower end? Well, if it could be the bad starter motor. It could be a uh, the one-way clutch or reduction gear, which is inside of the uh, engine cases, which the motor is turning. Uh, one of those two pieces may be going bad. <sighs> by you getting it to move a little bit by pulling the cord, that kind of tells me it's probably not the starter motor, it's probably your um, starter reduction gear or one-way clutch on the inside that's probably causing the problem. 
Dallas Jones had asked me, I have a 2015 Razor S. So do we. It cranks but does not start. I have fire. I'm getting fuel. The engine code is low voltage. Battery is charged. Do you have any ideas of what to check? I check voltage on, on the regular on the starter side and all three legs were 10.3. Oh yeah, that's, that's, you just found it. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure we did a, uh, a video on the, our 2015 Razor 900S. And if you would head over to our YouTube channel and look up that particular unit's playlist, and then I can walk you through how to test it. But I think you've already found it. So it's more than likely nine times out of 10, it's going to be the regulator rectifier versus the stator. But I'll walk you through the process to, um, to diagnose both, both uh, aspects of that charging circuit. Huh. Well, that's weird. I don't see well, I see people watching and I see some thumbs up, but I don't see any que questions in the chat. Huh. <laughs> I'm doing a live right now. Can I call you back? Mom. <laughs> and let's see what they're telling me in Skype. Here are the questions. Okay. Well, Chelsea, if you're listening, if you're watching, I'm not seeing anything in the feed for me to uh, communicate with anybody. So it looks like I'm just answering questions from last week or either she's trying to forward them to me. Is that what you're doing? Okay. She says, I will help you. Here are the questions. <laughs> so we're doing this through a, a Skype chat now. Ben, Ben Matthew, when changing oil on a TRX 700, so you need to change the O-ring gasket on the oil filter housing, I would recommend it because as time goes by and that things that O-ring sitting there compressed all the time, it's going to wear down after you take that uh, cover on and off even once or twice. And that is potential for you to lose uh, oil and that's not something you want to happen. So I would say you would, I would recommend changing it each and every time. Merlin Fox is asking me, my O2 Grizzly got a full engine rebuild, temp light flickers on and off, even at cold stops, not even two minutes from the drive comes on, engine goes into limp mode. Huh, that would make me really think there was something up with the, uh, the temperature sensor itself. So, um, go back and check your connections and also take a look at the, uh, the ground, make sure the engine is properly grounded again. Cause I've, cause it has to have that complete circuit for those sensors on the engines, the engine to work correctly, especially when, when they're referencing a ground. So a loose ground could, could be triggering what you're talking about. So take a look at the ground engine ground first, and then the, you may want to start looking at the sensor itself, the temp sensor itself. Boy, y'all are just all over me. <clears throat> Bombijo, respect from Bosnia. Respect back to you. <laughs> Pharmacist Beats. Hi, John. I have an 09 CBR 600 RR ABS. When bleeding the brakes with a vacuum air bleeder, what P PSI should I use? Just doing the normal lines now, bleeding the ABS is pretty complicated on this model. Hmm. I didn't think it was didn't think it was that tough. And as far as the the PSI on a vacuum, it's just going to pull vacuum, so it doesn't really matter. It just how quickly it's going to pull it. So it, whether it's 45, 90, 90, or one hundred and forty five, you really don't have to pull back on it. it. All it's doing is pulling a vacuum. It's not like you're pressurizing it. So you know, just go ahead and let it run. All right. John Maxwell is asking me best way to set idle speed without having a tack. You're not going to like this answer, John. I usually do it by ear. Um, I guess I've just done it so long. I, I can kind of sense when the engine's you know rotating at, at a comfortable loafing RPM. Uh, I usually do it by ear. Isn't that a little crazy? But if you don't have a tack, you can use uh, a voltometer with a uh, inductance clip to go around your um, spark plug if you can get to it. 
if not your trigger wire, something that will measure the revolutions. Just remember if it's a two cylinder, you have to, uh, um, or a four cylinder, you have to adjust accordingly or a three series for that matter, or a three cylinder, you have to adjust accordingly. But usually I just use my ear for the most part, honestly. John Maxwell, do you have any recommendations how, on how to clean and remove carbon buildup on the expansion chamber on a 2006 KX50 quad bike dies with throttle and the adjusting pilot screw has no, uh, no effect? There's a couple of different cleaners and there's one um, particular one that's exceptionally good from Yamaha on their Yama Lube division and it is... Um, combustion chamber cleaner and it's a spray uh, this stuff's amazing I've, i used it just to clean up the the carbon deposits on a piston that was already out of the machine and i couldn't believe it i mean this stuff it works it actually works as advertised so i would probably say spray in some of that maybe have to agitate it with a brush a little bit and just use water to wash it away and i'm pretty sure it's called combustion combustion chamber cleaner so that's the one I would recommend. All right, looks like they they are they're having to transfer the questions into the uh, the chat to where I can see them. So it takes them a second. David is uh, I'm not going to fall for that. David is saying all the best from East Coast Canada. Thanks for all the videos and the Q and A. Look forward to them. Thanks to you and to the team. Where well, you're very welcome, David. We appreciate you stopping in with us. In SKU 74, does my 2020 YFZ 450R SE have to be dynoed for the head pipe not to get cherry red uh, red at idle? That is going to be typical for that machine. Um, you could tune it out, but you're basically just going to be richening it up to where your head pipe isn't getting so hot. But it, that is typical for that machine. It, it That pipe, if I'm not mistaken is titanium and they glow red that's just what they do um i wouldn't i wouldn't mess with it uh, if you haven't modified anything um, as far as different intake different injectors different exhaust and i'm talking about a, a really extreme exhaust because the ones that come on there are really good to begin with uh, i wouldn't mess with it all right looks like i've caught y'all here Let's go back up to the ones I may have missed last week. Hosea Games had asked me, if I have to replace my stator, do I have to replace the rectifier as well? Or here you have to replace both at the same time, just in case you don't get the one <laughs> that you did not replace. If you want to be absolutely sure, I don't know. Well, I've said this many times, nine times out of ten, it's just going to be the regulator rectifier. That's just the way it is. The stator itself is very, very seldom, unless it's just being overtaxed to where they actually break down and either cause an open or a short in the windings. Because it's basically just a big coil with a, mag a magnetic field being generated, which generates electricity. But they typically don't fail unless there's just way too much of a, a draw on them and they overheat, hence either breaking connection or making a connection where it shouldn't be. Now, and there's ways you can test that. I mean, and we've gone through several videos and we've got a standalone for how to test your regulator rectifier. And I'll walk you through that just using a bolt-on meter. And if you see an extreme to where you've got a really, really low resistance rate or completely open, then, well, then you know you need to do something about it. And especially if your machine's still running, you can do a static test to see if you're reading somewhere in between 25 and 50 volts AC. Well, then you know it's okay, and it's just going to be the regulator rectifier. But um, in, as far as testing the rectifier, uh, that's easily done as well. And we've got several videos that can walk you through uh, how to do that. All right. Aldo Bega had asked me, I'm having a problem with my 2006 CBR 1000 RR. I got a new battery and charged it at a slow charge at night. And when I checked, checked it in the morning, it was 13 or more volts. Starts amazingly fast, no problems. But if I ride for more than 15 minutes and stop, when I tried to start it again, the battery is almost dead. 
when I did the la when I did the last test checking with the engine on, all three diodes showed nothing. It was supposed to be 15, right? So my rectifier is bad. Can you help me on this, please? I mean, I'm not sure I followed where you said it was supposed to be 15. 15 volts, uh, that would be a little bit too high. But a machine at a moderate RPM, you should be around 13.5. That's the voltage you should be. Now, if you're not seeing that, then yes, you have a problem with your, your charging system. And it is, as we've just talked about, it's either your voltage regulator rectifier or your stator. And on the Honda, you should be able to do a diode test, a reverse bias diode test to at least get half the diodes to where you can see if they're functioning or not. And if even one of them is not reading right, then there's your answer. Um, but you can also go in and do a static test on the, uh, the stator itself to see if you're getting AC voltage in excess of 25, 25 to 45 volts AC to take a look at. All right. All right. I think we had one or two more questions from last week. Snafflemeister. Well, y'all come up with some interesting handles. Great videos. One quick question. If your clutch cable keeps snapping down at the bottom near the engine, can you, is this a sign you need to rebuild the clutch? Definitely. <laughs> no doubt about that. Providing, of course, you're using a, either a high quality aftermarket or even better, an OEM clutch cable itself. But man, you must have the Kung Fu grip when it comes to uh, your left hand and it's, it's snapping it down low because as clutches wear, or not so much the clutch plates wear, but the baskets, they start getting edges, uh, almost like little steps on the inside of the basket from the plates moving in and out. And as those steps get larger, it puts more tension and hence will wear out your, your uh, cable quicker and then making it snap. So I'd say, yeah, it's time to go ahead and think about replacing the, uh, not just the clutch plates, but the clutch basket, especially the outer basket. The inner basket, it's probably okay, but I usually replace both of them as a pair, but that's entirely up to you. And depending on what machine it is, may want to look at a, an upgrade from Wiseco. Uh, whenever I have to go in and do a clutch, and especially if I'm going to replace the basket, if they make it, I'll go ahead and get it. It's amazing how smooth the, uh, the Wiseco system is, and I don't care which machine you're talking about. I've always been really impressed with them. Kirk Frith had asked me, Thunder, I replaced the stator, man, it's all electrical questions today. I replaced the stator on a 2012 Polaris Ranger 500 EFI 4x4. I did the AC test on the stator while running, like your video shows, it shows 9.8 volts on all phases. Do different machines put out less AC volts by, uh, volts while running. Yes, but there's no way um, 9 point volts, 9.8 9 volts AC is ever going to let you generate anything close to a DC output of 13.5. So there's your answer. 9.8 AC is not going to cut it. It has to be, I usually see it somewhere in between 25 and 45 volts AC, but that's the real trick. And you were doing the AC test on the stator. So, yep. I believe you got a problem for once. You're that one out of 10 where you need to uh, replace the stator. K didn't K. I'm really enjoying the engine rebuild videos you guys make. Very helpful. Do you have any tips on removing gaskets, what to use, etc.? <sighs> yes, I do. <laughs> well, I can tell you a couple of things not to do. Don't use a screwdriver, anything that's going to gouge into the surface you're trying to separate. They make gasket scrapers, and as long as you use them at the right angle, they're fine. Uh, the thing you want to stay away from is using a, uh, a high-speed disc, one of those uh, scotch bite discs. You can channel out a, uh, a surface so fast it'll make your head spin. Yeah, it'll take off the gasket, but it's also going to take off some material, especially the green ones because they're more abrasive than the other colors. What I typically do is spray them down with um, some type of a uh, brake cleaner, let it soak, that starts to loosen them up and just take them off layer by layer. And the worst offender of all of them are those Honda gaskets in you know, late 90s, 2000s, the green ones. 
One thing about them, they never leak, but they are so difficult to get off of there. It's time consuming, but don't get in a hurry because if you use that gasket scraper at the wrong angle, it's going to cut a groove and then you're going to end up with a leak. Not what you want to want to have to go through. Um, there's one other one. Uh, Heinz, um, H-E-I-N-Z. I believe they make a, a gasket removing, removing um, solution. You may want to look into that one as well. I haven't tried it yet, but I, I've I'd heard from uh, one of the YouTube guys that I watch on M539 uh, Restorations BMW channel, and uh, he swears by it. So, hey, I'm going to check it out too. And when I do, I'll report back on that. Let's see what else we've got on the on the live chat. Oh yeah, a couple more. Where do we leave off? In Segu 74, already answered that one. Brides like nacho. What's the best way to remove carbon deposits from piston and valves? We, I thought we just talked about that a second ago. Must have been a different person. Uh, uh, that Yamaha Yamalube combustion chamber cleaner. If I could see it over there, I'd, wa I'd walk over and get it. But there's so many, so many <laughs> different chemicals I have up on my shelves. It'd take me five minutes to find it. Abula Muhammad, hello for all. Hello to you. How are you doing today? MF is asking me, battery is good, but meter won't light up and can't start the bike. Okay. Well, that tells me that you've probably, well, there's going to be an electrical issue, of course, somewhere else. And that's when you need to go in and start checking your fuses and start with the main one. It should have a main one probably. It's probably going to be green. Probably a 30 amp, and that's going to be your main fuse. And it's depending on your make and model, because I'm just guessing, it's going to be near your starter solenoid because that's where everything usually branches out, especially on these smaller machines. Well, guys, did I catch up with everybody? Hank, is there anybody else typing a question? Yes, no, maybe. Hank's typing to me now. That's all we got. Well, hey, y'all are going to make my life simple today. Electrical questions. I'm good at those sometimes. Well, guys, thank you for coming and spending a little bit of time with us today, especially uh, shopping with us at Partzilla.com. Makes all of this possible. And, hey, if you've been a, if you've been having to wait a, a couple of extra days on your parts uh, for us to get them shipped out, take heart. That monster that we built uh, across the street, <laughs> is starting to hit on all cylinders. So if, if you're having to wait a day or so, you know, as we've been spooling it up, we apologize, but totally going to be worth it. And I can't wait to be able to uh, post a video of this incredible thing that the, uh, the, uh, the higher ups have, have engineered and built. It is truly something to see. But at any rate, I do want to say thank you for coming in and spending a little bit of time with us today. Everybody have a great weekend, a great week, and God willing, I will see you again this coming Friday at 3. So everyone, you take care.